Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I, uh, I really hope things will be legible. I, uh, I didn't quite anticipate the scale of this room, so well, I decided to use a blackboard. Um, I'll try to write big. <laughs> So I'm going to give, I think my talk is going to be mostly pretty basic, um, and I hope you know, comprehensible to the students. So I want to talk about something I've been thinking about recently, about um, kind of twists of supergravity analogous to, to topological twists of supersymmetric field theories that people might be familiar with. So I'll start by reminding you of something basic. So what's it? Supersymmetric field theory on Rn, something everybody probably knows, has this fermionic symmetry. Which live in some spin representation of spin n. And these satisfy some equations and some anti-commutation relations. So for example, if you view these fermionic symmetries as acting on the Hilbert space of a theory, the anti-commutator of your fermionic symmetries would be you know, momentum or energy. Um, so this following, there's been a great deal of activity in you know, high energy physics for a, for a very long time, maybe since you know, the late 80s. Uh, based on the following idea of the Witten. If we choose a fermionic symmetry Q, such that it squares to zero, so typically it will square to some translation, then um, computing Q invariant quantities is very simple. For example, so how easy, of course, depends on what Q you choose. So for example, if you can choose a nice Q, with a nice Q, this implies that correlators of Q invariant operators are independent of position. So this is what we can call a topological twist. Um, so for example, the OP is zero. Like there's no singular terms in the OP. Things are much simpler. And generally what happens, not always, but very often, Feynman diagrams of loop number greater than one just don't contribute. Um, it's kind of Q invariant calculations. This, of course, the difficulties people have with computing things in quantum field theory is that you know, there's all these infinite number of payment diagrams are very hard to compute. But if you just look at Q invariant things, normally you only compute things to one loop. Instant on corrections, then you have the whole answer. Whole answer. This gives rise to many exact calculations.
So this procedure is known under um, a rubric of twisting a field theory. It's one way you might like to turn this, this general idea. So you can say that the twisted field theory field theory has operators and the Q invariant operators of the original theory but in fact we also have to divide by divided by operators of the form like q times o. Given any operator, you can produce a new one by applying q. And the twisted theory, what you do is you take the invariant ones and you divide by the ones which are obtained from q. Um, why is this a good thing to do? I won't dwell on this point. Because q is a symmetry. If, if you know, you can think about a Stokes theorem or something like that, or it tells you the expectation value of Q of any operator equals zero, just because we, if we assume it's a symmetry of the quantum theory, this must preserve the functional measure. And let me briefly mention one very famous example of this procedure, which was investigated by Witten and later Cyberg from Microsoft. So, for example, if we compute, we can compute the partition function of supersymmetric Young Mills. Young Mills. in four dimensions. So of course nobody knows how to compute the partition function of non supersymmetric Young Mills. But this can be expressed entirely in terms of differential geometry. There's no perturbation theory really, there's no no Feynman diagrams, no ultraviolet divergences anymore. It's entirely some simple differential geometry. You count the number of Young Mills instantons. So in mathematics, this procedure of counting Young Mills instantons was uh, produced by Donaldson. This is great. Uh, so this method is incredibly powerful. But what I want to talk about is how to do this for supergravity. And we'll see that there are some nice things that come out of the supergravity version of this story. So, so what I want to talk about is firstly twisted supergravity. Um, then maybe I'll explain a little bit. The really great thing, at least in my view, about twisted supergravity is the following. So everybody knows, you know, the, the famous problem that Einstein's gravity is not normalizable. So it's not possible to construct the quantum theory because there are infinitely many ambig ambiguities, infinitely many possible counterterms. But in many cases, twisted supergravity can be quantized using standard techniques. So the famous difficulties So that the, the infamous difficulties about non-normalizability of gravity go away. And you can also, a project I'm working on now is ADS 
CFT or gauge gravity duality in this setting. So I need to tell you. So for the, are, are things legible to people? Yes, this is system works. That's great. You know, I always have trouble talking to physicists. My background is in pure math, and I'm really into things like homological algebra and algebraic geometry and category theory and stuff like this. So there's always an issue of language. What's that? That's good. But maybe you might not say this once I talk about ghosts. <laughs> so again, another thing people might probably are very familiar with is that if I consider only young nose theory, the field is a connection, right, as a one form, in all four, values in your, valued in your algebra. G might be S, U, N, or something like that. But there's a redundancy in description. If I take my connection into, say, let's do A, or X is some map from all four of my group. This transformation, call this, say, A sub X, then A and A sub X are physically indistinguishable. Sorry, it's basic stuff. So, you know, there's a redundancy in our description of our space of fields. Really, our space of fields is not this, in, this big space. It's, the, it's what the mathematicians is called a quotient, where I identify my A and my A axis for any X. So, today of Popov had this great idea. How do we understand, you know, we want to do a functional integral over this space. There's this huge redundancy. So how, how will we do this? So, today of Popov said, We can deal with the re redundancy by introducing ghosts. So what are ghosts? I can give you a kind of heuristic definition, but you know, of course I really want to introduce much more homological things, but I will re restrain myself from talking about the BV formalism. Um, so the heuristic idea of what's going on is we introduce we have a fermionic field, we call it the ghost field. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Kai, bad name probably. Corresponding to infinitesimal gauge symmetries. So the idea is, if we do a functional integral, integral over the field both a and chi, chi, well, this cancels the redundancy in the description of a. So let us why why I went off on this apparent tangent. Well, ghosts will be necessary to talk about that twisted supergravity. Time. I have forty-five minutes, is that right? Including questions. 
Okay, so like 40 minutes left. Okay. Um, so in ordinary gravity, it's kind of Einstein and Hilbert, I always like to stick up for Hilbert at this stage, as a mathematician, says that the fields gravity are kind of G, the metric character. But there is also, as before, there's a redundancy given by changes of coordinates. So when one wants to, if one imagines trying to do the path interval, we would have to um, not consider a functional interval of the space of metrics, but there's also this redundancy by changes of coordinates. So we should introduce ghosts. Which are fermionic fields, which live in vector fields on Rn. Okay. I actually believe possibly Feynman wrote a paper about introducing ghosts for doing gravity in the 60s. Now, supergravity is similar. Now, I don't know much about supergravity. I cannot probably write down you know, all the super symmetry transformations or whatever. They're very complicated. But the basic thing we need to understand for this talk is very simple. So the basic fields we have our G, a metric tensor, and there might be a bunch of other stuff depending on what theory we're considering. Maybe plus some other fields, which include a include the gravitino. So the gravitino, uh, what do I call it? Think of this as a one-form valley in the spin bubble. So it's, yeah, so it's a spinner valued one form. And just like ordinary gravity, there's a redundancy. We can do changes of coordinates as before, but also some kind of super change of coordinates. What does this mean? Supergravity has this remarkable feature called local supersymmetry. Which means that part of the redundancy is not just a vector field. We have a fermionic, we call it a gauge symmetry if you like. Q, Q, which depends on space time, depending on so we have field, and we think of it as a spinner. The smooth function on our end value is the spinners. So, whereas before, for ordinary gravity, Gauge symmetry was just a vector field, where for gauge theory, the gauge symmetry was a map to my group, my gauge group. For supergravity, the gauge symmetry is a vector field, which in the generates a change of coordinates, but also there's a fermionic gauge symmetry given by the spinner. Okay. So a minute ago we said, well, for day of Popov, Feynman, and so on, said that we want to get rid of this redundancy. We should 
introduce from ionic fields corresponding to the gauge symmetries. But those were ordinary bosonic gauge symmetries. We should also expect if we had a fermionic gauge symmetry, we introduce a bosonic ghost. So ghost for simple gravity. There's fermionic ghosts with the vector fields at all n, and also bosonic, which is some spinner. So when one treats the gravity in this way, one has this extra kind of bizarre bosonic field. So now I can tell you what supergravity is. Twisted supergravity, it's very simple. It's sim simply supergravity in uh, this supergravity is equal to supergravity in a background. Non-zero bosonic ghost. Okay. So we can think of this as something probably familiar to many people. And in gauge theory, you can think about the, you know, the, the Higgs branch or Coulomb branch of vacua. And in the Higgs branch, some of your matter fields have like it's a vacuum, so we tell that they're at infinity if they have a non-zero value. In the Coulomb branch, your gauge field might have some non-zero value at infinity. So really, what we're doing is selecting a vacuum of supergravity, where the theory becomes much simpler. So let me, let me, um, yeah? The principle is so general that one can always talk about twisted supergravity. However, of course, the features, the features, what twisted supergravity looks like, of course, will, will depend very much. That, it applies to all of them, yes. In dimensions bigger than one, sorry, dimensions bigger than two, because, as I'll explain in a second, there's equations in motion. So the equations in motion, the twisted supergravity, So let's assume, assume that our ghost, that the non-zero fields are the metric G and Q bosonic ghost. Then the equations of motion are that this, this spinner is covariant constant. Or this refers to the levy Vita connection. And secondly, p squared equals zero. It might happen that if you take n equals one supergravity in two dimensions, you, you can never satisfy this condition, but in three dimensions you can all you can always do so. So let's give you a little um, a brief example of what is what's going on here. Maybe for n equals one supergravity in four dimensions. Um, n equals one supergravity in forty. Well, of course, I should specify these are the equations of motion. There's also the Einstein equation for G. But as we'll see, condition one implies condition two, as we'll see in this example. So what are the what happens in this case? Well, it's equal to zero. Well, this implies that the holonomy of the metric fixes Q 
Well, if you think about a spinner in four dimensions, what matrices will fix a given spinner? It's going to be SU2, this in, in Euclidean signature. In particular, it's automatically reachy flat. This is all, again, for this. Um, so, it's kind of a drawing, picture of like something like what you might imagine to be vacua of n equals 1 zero gravity in 4D, where a vacuum is we specify how things behave at infinity. There's some big space of Vt flat manifolds. And at some special point, they have, they're not only Vt flat, but they have SU2 holonomy. This condition of having SU2 holonomy is equivalent to being Calavio. When our metric has SU2 holonomy, there's another vacuum branch of the moduli vacuum that can break off. This is where the bosonic goes to non zero. So, as you can see, this is a direct analog, Higgs and Coulomb branches of, of engaged theories. You know, in the, in the Higgs branch, if my matter field has some special symmetries, then some of the Coulomb branch breaks off. So, I want to finish by, I suppose, how, how long do I have left? Ten minutes, perfect, thank you. So, my, this is a pretty basic talk, but I haven't really got to the punchline yet. But we'll get to the punchline in the next ten minutes. So, for example, we take n equals two supergravity in four dimensions. This has a Donaldson twist. So in this twist, perturbation theory only extends to one loop. Just like we saw with gauge, gauge theory, And the partition function should be some kind of count of what people call gravitational incidents. Which are the same as manifolds with SU2 following. Why do I call it the Donaldson twist? Well, it has a feature that if I couple the gauge theory, gauge theory in this background is the twist introduced by Donaldson, gauge theory put in the supergravity background. So now we see that the problems countered long ago have disappeared. Not only can we define it at the quantum level, we have the answers to that differential geometry. There's no, no difficulties with Finn's eigens at all. No, it's not. Um, there's a definition, but we can uh, we translate it into an easier problem. Um, no, but people know quite a lot about that these things. It's it's you know you probably should the space is, is disconnected, so you probably should say well what are their kind of fix some discrete invariants like engage them fix some fix them up the analog with the angle. Um, and then it should be. So, let me discuss the example I'm really interested in. Um, and this example is only motivation for why everything should go away, although I, have, I haven't explained the details of why kind of complicated framing of diagrammatics should disappear. The basic point is a bunch of fields become massive and can be integrated 
So there really isn't much room left. A really interesting example, and what I'm interested in is type 2b supergravity. in 10 dimensions. Well, we saw that twisted supergravity, in twisted supergravity, the metric was satisfied that there, uh, there was on a closest covariant constant, which implies it has SUN holonomy. As you can hold on. So this is what's called Clavier. So you might, it's natural to guess what twisted supergravity looks like is it's kind of a gravitational theory. On Clavier manifolds. Now, a long time ago, 1996, Rashatsky et al. proposed just such a thing. Y manifolds, and we expect that the twist of type two B just is this. How, how long am I humming? There's a bunch of evidence for this, which I don't think I have time for, mainly involving ADS of T, which is a and to get to a conjecture. But the twist of B supergravity is equal to this BCLV theory, where the B stands for Bershatsky. I mean, in principle, one can do this by writing down all the fields of supergravity and doing some crazy computations, but I find them too hard for, my, for me to do. So now, let me give you another example of why this is a good thing and why the difficulties of normalization dis disappear. Following theorem, due to myself and my collaborator, C. Lee, the BCOV theory is, na is na naively non normalizable after all, it's a 10-dimensional supergravity theory. The scaling, scaling should automatically tell you it should not be normalizable in the naive sense. But even so, there is an essentially unique, there is, exists a unique quantization which is compatible with a certain 10-dimensional gauge theory. So here we're in a situation where, a familiar situation where the, if it's non normalizable you might think there might be infinitely many counter terms and so on. But there's some kind of remarkable cancellation all of this is fixed because basically basically possible counter terms in, in the in the gravity is cancelled with anomalies in the gauge theory. This is a this is a cartoon and there's more to it than this. So if you want your gauge theory to be anomaly free, you fix the counter terms you need. Gauge theory. Oh. 
OK. And so this is another example of 10-dimensional gravity, where you can really use ordinary perturbative techniques, fix the quantization uniquely, and you can have lots of fun by saying, you compactify four dimensions, how many does? OK, I didn't see your size. OK. Um, yeah. You can do ABS CFT and various other fun things with this. Oh, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> from, a, from a physicist's perspective, um, the LHC has not detected any supersymmetric particles. I, I like the LEC has not uh, detected any supersymmetric oh. particles well, yeah. so far. And I'm a mathematician, right? And I, 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 I've, and, um, I think it's probably likely this will continue next year. Fun. I, I understand. I mean, the, the second comment I have is that supergravity was invented to make gravity renormalizable. And so far, this has not been demonstrated to be the case. Yes. 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 No, it's not. Okay, so you cup, you introduce a 10D gauge theory? Coupled to the supergravity? Well, the, the 10 gauge theory is just the alternate twist of maximum supersymmetric gauge theory in 10 dimensions. So you can write down as a passing level. So you can write down the coupled interactions of these two guys and try to quantize that coupled system. Okay. That's what quantizes uniquely. Okay. Then you can try to decouple them, but they get, you can't decouple the gauge theory in about times. So where does the homological algebra come in? Uh, well, in a bunch of places, uh, in particular here. You kind of, there's some cohomology calculation going on here. The, um, these counter terms, the possible Lagrangians, kind of standard thing, you can compute, there's some cohomology group that tells you what they are. And similarly for the possible anomalies, there's also some cohomology group. And they're the same, some kind of baby case of ADSC. Two questions. So you just described this uh, theory, which is naively not renormalizable, but somehow, I guess you say it in some sense does have a continuum limit or something. Anyway, well, I don't know if you would go that far, but anyway, this is re this reminiscent a little about w of what people call asymptotic safety. No, absolutely. So yeah. Is there some connection that you? No, think no, it's, it's exactly the same idea. I mean. Asymptotic safety, the problem, the problem with asymptotic safety is that you go further in the loop expansion, there's more ambiguity. But here the situation is better, in fact, there's no ambiguity. It's, it's, well, why do you say there's more ambiguity? There's, there's no, no the ambiguity, yes. There's, there's no ambiguity. No ambiguity. As opposed yes. to what would you as about, to right. uh, The other question is about so you described the supergravity theory, which twisted, which in some sense is renormalizable, mm -hmm. um, even though the original untwisted theory is not. But the way you described it, it sounds like it should have the same local, it's just a different background, but it should have the same local degrees of freedom. And well, what intuitive reason can there be why these local degrees of freedom? Let me give you an example. So we'll take a 5D gauge system, 5D young node. It's not renormalizable. Put it, put it in the background where your, your gauge field is generic. Then, it's, then it becomes an abelian theory. But the gauge field is what? Is where well, put in a background with a non-zero gauge field. Yes. A di diagonalizable with distinct eigenvalues. Then it becomes an abelian theory, which is in the line. So this phenomenon well, really. is, is very easily visible even in ordinary gauge field. But you said more that you said it only had one loop or something like that. Um, in this, this example, no. This, this particular case is all loops. No, the other one. The, oh, the, the, other, the other one. one. Um, well, you no. Know, Maybe that, that, that fits pretty well with a, you know, a free theory only has zero loops. Right? So, so if I take an ordinary gauge theory with kind of some interesting background, it looks like a free theory. So it's, Are you ignoring non-perturbative effects when you say this? Yes, this is a, this is a, 
closely a perturbative story. Uh, it just I mean, seems strange that the physics would change so dramatically from one, no, you, one I, background to another. I'm not a physicist, I mean, so I'm. <laughs> my, my, my get out of jail free card for everything, right? <laughs> I, I have a question about um, the twisting. Could you give an idea more pre of, I don't know, what, what somehow it would mean physically, what this twisting theory, uh, uh, what do they really represent? And also, another question is that somehow here, you know, when you twist the theory, you have more symmetry. Can you use this twisty theory to do some perturbation around it? That is, can you relax this twist, you know, is there a, a procedure? Can you use it as a very symmetric way and then look for deformation around it? I mean, like, go, go back to the ordinary gravity back? Or, or, yeah, go above it, at least, you know, go back towards or towards something else. Because it's, if it's, you know, fully renormalizable, then it suggests another way to reorganize. Um, no, I think that, that's, that's a great question. I, I, have, I have no idea what happens when you go back and when you go back to the ordinary onthrusive gravity theory, I, I, I presume bad things will happen. I don't understand that. But you can you can freely move you can move around freely in the space of Lattea, where I, which have at least one uh, non-zero bosonic ghost. So you can, in that space, you can go anywhere. I I really don't know what to say except the bosonic ghost. It seems crazy. I I know, but I I. I Maybe somebody who knows more about super gravity might have a better interpretation. Any more question, perhaps from the students or postdocs? Then let's thank Kevin again.